thank you so much. Uh, I hope every, everything is visible. Um, I should offer a couple disclosures. I'm an internal medicine and addiction doc, uh, and my research history is focused on vulnerable populations. I have no pharmaceutical grants, honoraria, or related business. I do own some shares of medical equipment company, and I have been engaged in advocacy. And there's a photograph of me uh, advocating uh, with Kate Nicholson in the United States. Um, I'm not representing my employers here. The situation we find ourselves in is uh, like that, which I had commissioned for a cartoon for an article written I wrote in 2016, where a doctor and patient are in an office and they're surrounded by documents, the CDC's guideline, U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, headlines about the overdose epidemic. And the doctor says, too many people are dying. The situation's out of control. I kind of thought they were helping you, but right now I have to stop your Lortab pills. And the patient looks aghast and says, what did I do? And right outside the window, there is a individual injecting a drug and a graveyard full of syringes and perhaps we do know that there's a relationship between what happened in offices and what happened outside of offices, but still this is very much how it has felt for patients in the US and some in Canada, I suspect, over the last few years. So this talk comes in four parts. One is how did North American policy shift to prescription opioid dose reduction and stoppage? The second is a broad view of what the outcomes of that shift have been. And then the third is scientific data on taper or stoppage in individual patients for and against. And then part four is my view of the right thing to do. So obviously this is a little more policy focused than the last uh, presentation. So how did North American policy shift? Um, I'm showing you data from the United States, but in some fundamental way, North American policy shifted because those red bars, which represent the total number of drug poisoning deaths in the United States, rose and rose year by year with roughly two thirds of those deaths involving opioids. And the other lines on that graph involve deaths due to suicide and homicide and firearms. They are not negligible, especially suicide. But um, the red bars rising is what got our attention and did so similarly in Canada. The narrative as we understand it, which certainly has some truth to it, is that uh, for about 20 years, prescribers prescribed a lot. And to some degree, were led to do so by pharmaceutical uh, companies, although I think we led ourselves in a variety of ways to do that. And um, reports typically focused on our carelessness in heavy opioid prescribing. But the reality is that times have changed. And this figure is United States data through 2018 as published on the CDC website, but it's commercial data. The rate of overall annual opioid prescriptions per 100 persons is well below what it was in 2006. Uh, which is the earliest year the CDC posts from its commercial data source. Uh, the rate at which doses, high dose prescriptions are written is similarly well below, 66% lower than 2006. It's fallen a lot. This is Canadian data by province. I won't go through it in detail, but you can see there's something of a similar trend, although very often the rise was a bit less in Canada and the fall a little less severe, uh, kind of holding the stereotype in a way about Canada versus the US. So what explains that decline in prescribing? And I think we could break down the explanation in terms of scientific information, a great deal of which was summarized in the talk immediately prior to mine, and policy information. But scientifically, my shortest version would be to say, opioid use disorder with pills is real. And pills originate in some way with prescribers, even if it's not always the originally prescribed person who develops the opioid use disorder. Heroin use that starts with pills is real enough. Among whites in the US in a national survey, those who had heroin use disorder were asked, what did you start with? Uh, and about 53% said with pills. That's not necessarily that they were the patients with long-term pain, et cetera, but that's what they said. And with African-Americans, it was more like 25%. Opioids benefits for chronic pain have always been a mixed bag with some actual benefit as we'll come to, but also real challenges and problems. But scientific reality is not the sole account as to why policy has shifted or why it has shifted in the way it has. Um, real world, uh, there's been a lot of prescription focus from journalists and from officials because they love simplicity. They love simple accounts of major problems even when they are somewhat incorrect. A classic quote from the National Public Radio in the US is we, that is the US, consumed 
of the world's prescription opioids. That was just broadcast this summer. It dates back to a quote from a DEA official in 2004, never backed up. And you can go check out on the International Narcotics Control Bureau website for yourself that the United States does not consume 80% of the world's opioids. It's a little south of 50%. Uh, policy, however, is not just made by journalists or just by politicians. It's really made by multiple entities acting at once. I tried to depict them here, and it's hard to do so when talking about both Canada and the United States at the same time. So this is a little bit US-centric, but think in terms of overlapping voices that all drive changes in care, which have really been large. We have the Congress, uh, United States federal departments like the Food and Drug Administration, our Department of Justice, which has a heavy criminal justice interest in prescribing, provincial and state regulators, boards and provincial colleges, uh, guidances and metrics like those from the CDC or the United States Department of Veterans Affairs, Canadian national and provincial guidances, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, which is a US uh, quality metric agency. There are payers, which I show in the lower right hand, uh, in the United States, especially payment uh, mechanisms are quite diverse and Byzantine, but those payers have a lot of influence over what is covered. Uh, they can demand a dose reduction. And certainly because we cannot possibly read all the documents that all these agencies are generating, many of us are still prodded by whatever is the voice that we read uh, in the media. Um, one simple policy example is a quality metric. This is operating in the United States. It was disseminated by the National Committee for Quality Assurance. It's called the use of opioids at high dose. And essentially it says, look, if you're a health plan, count the number of patients who receive over a dose of 90 morphine milligram equivalents, then divide by the total number of patients. The higher that number, the worse your care. Uh, there is an exception for hospice, but there is no exception for complex illness. And there's no particular exception for people already on those medicines. So the metric pushes dose reduction as a way of cleaning up your organizational act. It's enforced by payers in various degrees and various ways by United States Medicaid programs, which is a predominant care program for the poor. It's built into incentive payments offered by the United States federal government. And if one is to believe a, a report on the Office of the Inspector General website in the United States, it's used to uh, refer physicians for criminal justice investigation. Just a quick example, my state Medicaid office uh, understands US law to mean that it must mandate that quarter by quarter, the total maximum milligrams permitted must go down so that all patients previously at 300 have to get to 270 and then 240 and then 190 and then 150. There are exception clauses in the Alabama uh, uh, process, but you have to file for them and it can be tricky to get that exception, but that is to Alabama's credit in a way. Within the Canadian context, um, uh, Hans Clark and others have written about some concerns of a similar ilk. Um, Healthcare Quality Ontario measures the percentage of patients initiating taper, already kind of a softer, gentler version because initiating taper doesn't mean that everyone's dose has to come down. Clark at all point out that the guidelines note that uh, from Canadian guidelines note taper can be stopped if there's an increase in pain or a decrease in function, which is great. But then they hypothesized that there could be an increase in risk to people who've been tapered who didn't need it in the first place. And they spoke about a climate of fear, which is not a great outcome to have. So let's talk more about the outcomes of our shift in prescribing. Again, I'm trying to juggle between US and Canada here. Um, United States provisional drug overdose data. These are total overdoses, not just opioids. Uh, you can see the number rose, 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 and then in 2018 kind of leveled off, looked like we were beginning to get somewhere. And then in 2019, pre-COVID, we erased all of our improvement, uh, despite the massive reduction in prescriptions. And opioids are about 65 to 70% of those overdose deaths. Of course, most of them have something to do with illicit fentanyl and heroin and uh, the unpredictable nature of the drug supply in our country. My employer, the United States Department of Veterans Affairs has been uh, pretty aggressively uh, requiring reduction in opioid prescribing since 2013. Uh, so this was a headline, as you can see on the left-hand side uh, from this summer, uh, there's a 70% reduction in patients who receive long-term opioids uh, per its press release. But it's important to ask, well, what was the outcome? What's the outcome for the patients of, of achieving that kind of reduction? So the one outcomes analysis that's published goes through 2016, which would capture the first three and a half years or so of reduction published by Lynn et al in 2019. And that big dashed line is going up, which is the total number of opioid overdose deaths. Um, and then the 
The small dotted line is the opioid overdose ref death rate involving potentially prescribed opioids, which are called natural and semi-synthetic opioids. And it may be going down a tiny hint, uh, but not a lot. But perhaps a little bit um, more concerning to me is the additional line in the same graph, which I'm now showing you in white, which asks this, and it's based on the left-hand axis on this graph. It says, of those veterans who died of overdose, how many had gotten a prescription from the VA in the three months before they died? And that is a number we've managed to bring down a lot, which is to say, we have not necessarily altered the course of death. In fact, that's going up but we've reduced the chance that we have touched the patient with a prescription before they're dead. But that wasn't my original notion of what it would mean to institute a program of safety. Simply removing your fingerprints doesn't make the patient more safe. Access to care is a similar outcome of concern here. Uh, this is based on a study published in JAMA Network Open, secret shopper study. People called doctor's offices in Michigan and said, my mother, my father needs a new doctor. By the way, they're on long-term opioids. And 41% of doctor's offices said, no way, we're not taking uh, your father or your mother. Uh, in survey data, there are similar, if not more alarming findings. There are about 10 million people in the United States who are on long-term chronic opioids. So if those people have diminished access to care, it's going to be hard to protect them. Similarly, in the Canadian context, Dr. Andrea Ferland makes a a stated a concern, and she's no small expert in this area of both taper and opioids, uh, that there's a certain amount of stigma uh, among patients who have chronic pain and have received opioids. This is an example from the United States, a photograph taken in a Texas office in September of 2020. Notice regarding prescription narcotics, skull and crossbones, poison. This office does not do long-term pain management with the following medicines. Uh, we will refer you to chronic pain management just to make sure the message is completely clear. There's a picture of the Grim Reaper and a homeless person uh, with the words drug addiction and more, yet more skulls over their back, um, that would be an example of stigma. Um, but you might say, well, where would that come from? But it, it's not, it's like a step beyond, but it's not a giant step beyond the CDC's own publicity campaign, which says prescription opioids can be addictive, blue, a dangerous, blue, and only takes a little to lose a lot. Of course, the message is about the pill bottle, not about the person. So in principle, it's not stigma, but it kind of leaves you with the sense of, well, what kind of a person would really do this? What kind of a person would take this sort of thing? Sort of like Harry Potter and the Death Eaters, you know, like it just sort of pushes that. And I think this is a kind of campaign that we can retire at this point. An outcome that really is part of the inception point of my concern is something that typically does not make the news, but in this case, dead, which is when, uh, Dose reductions or stoppages are initiated and a patient winds up dead. In this case, it was reported by ABC News in Utah. Adam is the gentleman on the right of that photograph at a younger age, uh, but due to insurance and dosage changes, Adam no longer had regular access to pain medication he needed. He was a working guy. He was doing, I don't know, it was construction or line maintenance stuff. His wife did a full podcast on this death, Beth Darnell. Uh, no, uh, her name is Darnell, but it's not, it's Palmer, Palmer. And the night before he left us, says Adam's daughter, he gave us all hugs and told us how much he loved us. I'm glad he's not in pain anymore, even though we do miss him. These very rarely make the news, but we see them and they are recorded privately because they get them they merge on Twitter and on Facebook and family members report them. And we're not recording them in any systematic way, except for one private individual who I know uh, uh, here in Birmingham. So let's acknowledge having said all this, what's unknown. Is there a group of patients who would have been protected by the opioid taper or the opioid stoppage and who would have otherwise been harmed by continuing them? How do we know which people those are? We don't really know that. What explains the poor outcomes of taper? Why exactly do those poor outcomes happen and for whom? We don't know exactly. And we should, if there's going to be large scale policies that are required on this domain. So at this point, I wanna to turn to the issue of scientific data for and against opioid taper at a little bit more scientific level as opposed to a policy discourse. So pro taper argument, some of which echoed through the talk before me might be as follows. On average, statistically, opioids don't outperform non-opioid therapies for chronic pain. 
Long-term opioids have risks. Most other therapies have less. There are side effects like constipation, mental slowing. These are definitely causal. There are associations found in the literature that are somewhat persuasive, like certain kinds of infection and endocrine side effects from the opioids. There's a risk of overdose, which clearly can involve prescription if that's on board at the time of death. And there is volatility of pain or of the emotional state when one is taking opioids regularly. This is a pushback phenomenon and I'm using explicitly psychological language, but it's coral, it is in uh, the previous talk when, we talk when you heard about opioid induced hyperalgesia and at the extreme end of that volatility is addiction. So these risks, all of them are often low in terms of absolute terms, the percentage of people who actually get them, but they are more common with than without opioids on whole. So that would be an argument to remove them. So the data we have, large scale studies of outcomes of taper undertaken usually in trials, mostly with voluntary patients, is summarized with two papers that I refer to here. Frank et al. reviewed 40 studies, which included five randomized controlled trials, which had 261 patients. Most were short-term, voluntary, multimodal, high-touch services. And they asserted that there was very low quality evidence, but evidence that opioid dose reduction may improve pain, function, and quality of life. They noted that there was no data on the effects of mandates and few data on suicide or transition to illicit drug use. A review of many other studies published by Fishbane et al. looked at pain outcomes and said that 80% of the studies they could find, many of which were before and after studies showed pain improvement or no change. Although they, uh, these studies were not designed to assess who left the clinics or fled the clinics when opioids were changed. Okay, what's the general argument against opioid tapering as a policy? Well, opioids are not ineffective, that's never been shown. And for some, they are what works and what fits best with their life. The dose risk correlation, which is so central to our taper discussion, doesn't actually support prescribed dose as the main risk driver for things like overdose, which have been uh, key to those 90 and 120 morphine milligram equivalent thresholds. And research to date, reductions have not been shown to improve safety. And in research, we're seeing harm under regular conditions of practice. Let's talk about dose first. What you're seeing here are comparisons of two curves. Veterans who died while receiving prescription opioids, that's the red line, and their doses are on the x-axis. And veterans who didn't die while receiving prescribed opioids, that's the gray line. You'll see that the red line is shifted to the right relative to the gray one. There is an association between the dose and the likelihood of overdose. But both lines peak well below 90 morphine milligram equivalents, which is to say most of the overdoses, at least in the veterans population, which is highly cited, happen at low dose, which means the problem is probably not just about the dose, it's about something else. Veterans Affairs data by my colleagues and collaborators, Elizabeth Oliva, look at the entire medical record and construct models for risk factors predictive of overdose or suicide. And by the way, the same risk factors predict both in prescription recipients. And what you see, and it's admittedly a bit small, but you know, the green line is the co-prescribing of a benzodiazepine, a 1.4 fold increased uh, hazard of risk. Uh, medical conditions are in the light blue lines. In the magenta lines, you see the increase in the odds of overdose suicide associated with PTSD, depression, bipolar disorder, other mental health conditions. And those very tall red lines are the increased odds of having an overdose or suicide related event in a person who's already had an inpatient mental health uh, treatment uh, episode or a detoxification. All these things figure into what is currently used in the VA as its opioid risk mitigation model. By comparison, dose also increases risk in these models. A 120 morphine equivalent dose increases risk by about as much as having PTSD and being on an extremely low dose. Uh, we're gonna go through a series of studies relatively quickly, all about real world dose reductions. Prescription opioid stoppage in veterans was followed by suicidal ideation in action in 11.4%. This is retrospective. The stoppages were often because of concerning behaviors in the patients. Dose variation was associated with an increased overdose risk, whether the variation was upward or downward. This is in Kaiser Colorado Health System. Four more studies. <laughs> Cessation from high study, high dose in Vermont's Medicaid population was typically rapid, done in just a few days. 
and it was followed by a need for emergency care. Clearly, that doesn't sound too good. Cessation in a small safety net clinic in uh, Seattle, uh, often based on concerning behaviors in the patients, was associated with a three-fold increase in overdose death risk. Uh, small, small, small study. Cessation was associated with termination of outpatient care relationships uh, in a New York study. Cessation was associated with incident heroin use in a Kaiser Colorado study, case control, very high quality published this summer. A study that I'm a co-author on and helped spur to happen is by my colleague, Elizabeth Oliva at the Veterans Affairs Administration in the US, looking at veterans who received any opioid at all in 2013 and looking at the outcomes of which ones died of overdose or suicide through end of 2014. And there were almost 3,000 such deaths. So I'm not saying they're cause and effect, that's just the deaths that happened. And an independent variable or predictive variable in that model was discontinuation or not, interacted with time of receipt to see if discontinuation mattered differently if you'd been on them long-term versus short-term and controlling for all those other factors that I showed you in the prior slide. Deaths from suicide were increased fivefold for people who had been on them 91 to 400 days before stoppage and eightfold if on over 400 days. And the same kind of finding was found for overdose. All of this is quote, retrospective data. Let's be cautious about that. You look back in a database, you find an association, you wanna say, my gosh, this is all cause and effect. But please realize that very aggressive conjecture from retrospective databases drove the emphasis on dose and dose alone as the risk modifiable a factor in the CDC's guideline itself. No need to overclaim what these new data show. It's just that they're not showing what would, would have hoped to have seen and suggest that there's a problem with the conditions of practice in which opioid taper is pushed. So what's my view of the right thing to do? I don't have an overarching view as you're going to see. I'm just gonna offer two cases, each one brief. Case one is a defensible taper. And it's from a case I presented at a TEDx talk in 2014. A 45-year-old woman with whole body swelling, anasarca, and sedation from opioids and benzodiazepine. She was my patient. She had a history of heroin use, HIV, severe chronic pain, and anxiety. She had been on methadone from a treatment program at over 120 morphine milligram equivalents, and actually over 120 milligrams of methadone. Sorry, I should be careful. That's way higher. And oxycodone at 40 milligrams a day, and benzodiazepines, which I did not start, but somehow inherited. And she was falling asleep in the office and she was swelling up, which we thought was a side effect of the methadone. There was manifest harm. We commenced with a lot of support an involuntary forced taper. I don't wanna hide that. There was a ton of anxiety and stress for me and for her, and we did that. And ultimately she felt a ton better and she thanked me and she was doing better even a decade later. Uh, so this is a defensible taper based on a manifest harm. Here's a bad taper from a hospital we'll call Cashlack Memorial Hospital, which is the fictional hospital used in the Curbsiders podcast. A man in his late 50s or early 60s who had multiple medical problems, alcohol use disorder in remission, pain of many joints, on methadone and oxycodone for pain at a high dose. And he was at some equilibrium state and he was tapered slowly by a clinical pharmacist with a physician supervising based on a belief that the dose reduction would confer a safety benefit. And in the chart, which I had the chance to review, there were two very interesting notes. The pharmacist wrote that the patient expressed some concern, but agreed to further reduction of dose. A contemporaneous note from the psychiatrist basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not sure I can survive what they're doing with the dose reduction. They don't interact with each other, these two notes, but they're in the same chart. The outcome was that a few weeks after about the second step in this taper, the patient was admitted through an emergency department for intoxication and sedation. The patient had taken all the remaining opioids, alcohol, diverted benzodiazepines, and said they were in despair over the opioid taper. The patient survived, but very nearly died. This is a well-intentioned taper that caused harm. I wonder about what the patient said to the two different clinicians, but what was said to the psychiatrist uh, seems to have been the truer statement. So what do I think is right? Well, in my view, any clinician who thinks a patient is harmed by a treatment has authority to change it, provided they address the risks of making that change. 
And doing that without the patient's consent means more risk. Acting based on dose alone, however, was never the best inference from the available data on the risks of a problematic therapy, opioids, which really suggests a web of risk factors operating. We can make that web worse with taper policies or mandates or effective mandates. Humility and dialogue, including patients and their families, is what I think would help most. And with that, I'm done. If you'd like more information, there are a number of scientific papers that are up online. Several of them are open access, but I'll send them to anybody who wants them if they can't get them. And I have a more recent TEDx talk that's more focused on challenges from measuring things through the perspective of opioid dose.